telling my story down here. Wait, wait, no, 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 stop. Okay. Sorry. It's not an interesting story. I don't care about your story. No, is it ta- just ta- talk more. I'm trying to get it because it's not, it feels like it's picking your, your volume up very, okay. very low. Yeah, here, while I'm booting, getting ready, my research ready, you talk about whatever shit I'm not going to even bother listening to you, but you can talk away from. That sounds good. Let's go one, two, go on tree. Okay. One. Tree, two. Oh. Tree. <laughs> oh, it is on tree. Oh. Yeah, I'm never having you on this podcast ever again. <laughs> All right. One, two. Do you know when you're recording paranormal activities? Mm. So when you ask a ghost to be like, Ooh, oh, tell me more. If you're in the room, knock. Was that a ghost? Is that a ghost? Hello, come in. When, when you're looking at the sound waves of it. So if he, like us, if I knock the table, if we look at the sound waves, it like it peaks and then goes lower and it tapers off. Mm-hmm. Where if a ghost knocks, it's like reverse. It goes and I go up to the bang. Yeah. So forever. What does that mean? It means there's a ghost. Knocking. But what does it mean? Are, do ghosts walk backwards is, is my question. Do you think they do everything in reverse? Are ghosts are humans with the rewind button pressed is what I'm asking. That's the question I have. Li- living life in reverse. Interesting. Yeah. Kind of are because they're dead people walking around, which is like the opposite of human people walking around. Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike. And in this old podcast, we are getting spooky. Extremely spooky because get a load of this. There's someone in the room. Get the gun. Get the gun. No command. Have a gun. Which is exactly uh, what somebody did actually in this story. Somebody got the gun. But we will get to that. Now, this is a story which involves uh, Georgian London. Governors. Uh, other London London th- things. Um, Hello, uh, mate. Hello, mate. There we go. That's the, that's pretty that's much it. Just that. Right? Just ad nauseum. Smog. Coal. Child labor. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, yeah. Big, uh, big fan. Cheap labor. Mm-hmm. I know, it's the best kind of labor. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? Pay for your labor? Come on now. <laughs> but most importantly, this story, it involves a ghost and a gun. Have you ever seen a ghost? Mmm. No. Uh, honestly, no. I've never seen a ghost. I have no good ghost stories at all. Uh, I have never experienced... I've never experienced anything actually paranormal in my life. Which is weird because I am a big fan of the paranormal, but I've never... Seen a ghost, mm-hmm. experienced the ghost, experienced the haunting. You, a named stranger who I haven't introduced to the podcast yet? Uh, no, I've never seen a ghost yet. I'd be the same as you. Mm. Uh, super interested in all, everything paranormal, yeah. all uh, spooky shit. But yeah, personally myself, I've never experienced anything out of the ordinary. I'd love to, and I'm very open to it. I feel maybe that's what's wrong. Maybe I'm like coming on too strong. I'm, I'm too eager. To yeah, I think you are. Yeah, maybe I maybe I need to play it cool more, and they'll and they'll come to me. I think they can smell your desperation at this point. That's why you're not seeing ghosts. That's it. Yeah, I feel like I'd I'd have like too many questions for the ghosts. Like, yeah, who are you? Where have you been? And you're like just... the the guy at the nightclub who's like, can I buy you a drink? Yeah, yeah. And then no, you can't. <laughs> exactly. And the ghost was like, listen, buddy, I'm just here to scare a couple of people. For this whole episode, I am not alone in my little black void. I'm joined by, hmm, how would I describe you? A mysterious man, an enigma, really, I think is the best way to put it. Um, some, some now may call him a man of mystery. Others, they just call him Keith. Guest extraordinaire on the That Chapter podcast. Keith, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. My listeners, my incredible listeners, they want they want to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, and you t- tell them, tell them a little bit. Folks at home are curious. Who is this cat who just suddenly appeared on that chapter podcast? Who am I? Where would they have heard of you? Yeah, I'm just uh, just just a regular dude. Just uh, someone who enjoys spooky shit. It's funny, like, we're both from Ireland, and I feel like there's... It's kind of like a wider consensus of Ireland just kind of being, like, haunted and spooky. You got old... It's a lot of history there. A lot of history. A lot spooky of history. Spooky castles. Mm, yeah. Old haunted forests, you know, pagan things, a lot of mythology, stuff like the Banshee and that kind of stuff, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty creepy. You know, I've never experienced, uh, seen or experienced, nor experienced the ghost, uh, rather, ever. Now, my, my, I'd say no, my family has. 
Hmm. Some ghost stories from the fam. Uh, my grandmother, she used to say she could hear the banshee before somebody died. Literally, no joke. She actually would say it. Really? No, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm not joking. She genuinely would say that. No, I don't Maybe she was saying it to like fucking just scare the kids or yeah, something, yeah, yeah. but we would believe it. And she was a very, she was one of those old women who would like give people books into paranormal and the supernatural. And okay. she was definitely like one of those cats who was yeah. really interested in like spiritualism and stuff like that, which I guess we will get more into in this episode. But this is your family home. I'm not going to say where, but your family home, which I know there's like a, a history of witches and stuff out there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. It's actually, well, the house is actually built on a great, uh, not a graveyard, a, um, so it's, it's in like a kind of this little, like, I don't know what you call it, neighborhood. And it's all built on a jail. Like literally the road is called old jail, like old jail road or something. Right. Um, and the thing was when they were building houses, like probably close to a hundred years ago now, um, I remember that so it was, it was a jail that had been demolished and they were building all these houses on the side of the jail and the person like one of the architects or something said one of those houses is on the graveyard the jail's graveyard okay. but they would never say which house right. for obvious reasons but so uh, like people have been convinced that this house was on the graveyard yeah. of the jail like people who have been there uh, people who I would trust and believe their stories like these are not like crackpots who believe in all sorts of weird stuff like these are very scientific serious people they've said like they've experienced things in this house like felt people in the room felt somebody standing behind them heard somebody coming up the stairs there's actually one person i know he stayed there for a couple of nights he refused to stay in that house ever again and he's a, like a doctor or something right yeah but he said he would never a legit source house. yeah exactly like he wasn't bullshitting like he would have no reason to bullshit you know that kind of way now having said that i've stayed in this house that i'm talking about like many times never experienced anything Right. Ever. Even like, that's the thing about kind of haunted houses, I always feel is like, even if it's, you don't believe in it, it's nothing there or whatever. I feel like if you had the idea, oh, if somebody told you, oh, this place is haunted, you would start, your brain would start playing tricks on you and you'd start hearing things or like a house is settling and you'd be like, oh, it's a ghost. You know, your psychology would start kind of working against you and you'd get really, really freaked out. But no, I never. That's interesting you say that. We had my first year in college, we lived in like a very, very old house and. It was, we'd always hear in the middle of the night, uh, like doors slam and creak and so, but like there was never any a draft. There was never a draft that went through the house, like, or any wind come, all the windows were always closed and stuff, but uh, it was like maybe like one o'clock in the morning, so we'd hear like a door slam shut and we'd go out, but like nothing would be there. But we started making a joke about it at the start and we just called the ghost Frank, mm-hmm. you know, and then it was from hey, then. Yeah, we, we'd, we'd hear a noise like, all right, Frank. And then we just move on, where I think if we had to f- start getting scared from the start and freaked ourselves out, we probably would have heard more mm. about it. But because we kind of made a joke about it, we never thought about it, and it kind yeah. of went away. But we didn't feed into it. Yeah. What a great story. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, today's... <laughs> a great story that got, uh, went nowhere, so I've seen nothing. <laughs> okay. So, the point of the story is, uh, I have no idea what was going on there. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. A door slammed. Oh, shit, man. <laughs> So today's story, we'll just get into it now, is one, it's a key, this is a story now that straddles the line between ghost story and true crime, which is my, my... Forte. Forte. That's the word I was looking for. My brain failed me there for a second. That's yeah, why so I mean. True crime is my forte, but I, I, I do, uh, like, I think ghosts and all that kind of stuff is really fascinating, so I want to talk a little bit more about it. And we will begin with this episode, which, as I said, straddles the line. And this is a story that definitely still resonates. In fact, on the 3rd of January 2004, to mark the 200th anniversary of the events of today's tale, a group of ghost hunters gathered in London at the same site and they raised a toast to a bricklayer whose stubbornness, along with another man's recklessness mixed with a couple of beers, became a 200-year long headache for the British courts. Let's do it. To properly set the scene, we need to delve into a real quick uh, history lesson here for you folks. In the early 1800s, which is when this story takes place, you got your Thomas Jefferson, you got your Napoleon, you got your Beethoven. That dog must be real old at this stage. So some things, you know, were were dicey, different times, good for some, you know, not all. uh, And that's about as much as the historical context. You know, the important part here is I tell the story and I get all the details wrong, which is the whole historical context I've got going on here. Things weren't certain, though, to put it lightly, you know. It's what called what was called the Romantic Era of the arts, poetry, paintings, but war, especially in England, where our story takes place, was was in the minds of the general populace, uh, especially war with the French. French, man, up to no good. 
as usual. At it again. At it again. Classic. Classic for the lads over there. So specifically, Hammersmith is where we are visiting today. And in the 19th century, it was pretty far away from being the hustling, bustling London borough that it is today. Yeah, uh, to for those who don't know where Hammersmith is, it's pretty central. It's it's west of places like Buckingham Palace and Hyde Park. Uh, today, it's the London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. It's known for being the home of three football clubs, tree, uh, and their grounds, <laughs> tree. Uh, Chelsea, Fulham, and Queens Park Rangers. They all call it home. So back then, this Hammersmith area, and uh, you know, they, it, it, was, it was still kind of was like semi-rural. Like there's still lots of fields. So it wasn't like um. You know, not the village it is today. Yeah, not 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 the little hamlet it is today. So, um, like today, it's one of the most has one of the most expensive ooh residential properties in the whole of the UK. And as you can probably guess, uh, Hammersmith, though, of the early 1800s, as I said, it was an entirely different world from what it is today. This was before running water, before gas mains, and even electricity. This would have been a time when they would have been using whale oil still. Whale oil. Mm, and they were having a whale indeed. of a time. Indeed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> mm, indeed. Uh, definitely. They had a good old time with the whale. Hunting, killing whales. And people back then, they were very, they were still very superstitious. Um, it wasn't too hard to find like a campfire story. And a story that would eventually snowball into like a mass hysteria like one story one lad telling another guy's story and then everybody's freaking out the next day and the people of these days though i feel like what's important to know about the people of these days these early like this is late georgian early victorian times they loved horror more way more even than we do nowadays i think they loved horror they loved ghost stories it was like one of everyday the, life it was everyday life yeah, exactly. It was one of the, was the primary topic of conversation in the bars and the dens and whatever you'd be up to. Like this was this was an age that they strongly believed in phrenology. So like you know, like the reading of fortunes via the bumps on their heads. What? Yeah, they were like they they feel for bumps on the heads and certain bumps meant certain things. Wow. And so they strongly believed in that. Fairies, ghosts, seances were a lot. Yeah. Galvanism, that was a theory that they had, that uh, about the human body could be re- reanimated through electric shocks. So, uh, Like a zombie? Like a zombie, yeah. Or, I mean, this was Frankenstein. But also like a zombie. Is Frankenstein a zombie? Oh, that's a cool question. Um, What brings a zombie back to life? Mm. Just hunger? I don't know. Yeah, just being hungry, I think. Yeah. Just starving. Where, I, I, where Frankenstein needs like a third party to step in. Go, oh, yeah. yeah. And so this was... Sorry, do you have more? No, no. I was, okay. like, I was going to talk about more about Frankenstein. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, you can go, go, go off, King. No, it, was just, it wasn't even about Frankenstein. It was about your theory. <laughs> okay. So so this was a time between the publications of The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, which is widely regarded as the first gothic horror novel, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is in 18... Hey, fucking Frankenstein again. In 1818, he comes up again, this bastard. Horror fiction, like at this time, was all the rage amongst the intellectuals. At the time. And essentially those lucky enough to be able to afford the blockbuster novels. But essentially also being able to have the education enough to read them. Like this was during the time uh, in history during the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. So you had masses of people coming from the countryside to the big smoke. And they were bringing all these superstitions from the countryside in with them to the cities. And oftentimes they would move into like these big, huge, spooky houses that would have secret passageways. Hmm. and servants who dressed like ghosts like it was very eerie a very yeah. eerie time to live in and it was very strange for everybody to be there so you can imagine people would start believing in ghosts and you know ghosts were like so much part of everyday life that there was actual real life ghost buzzers what? in the 19th century oh, oh shit. Shit. tell me more tell me more so in the 1860s there was a society called the ghost club Nice. And this was launched in London, England. Um, this had started at Trinity College in Cambridge, uh, where a couple of gentlemen uh, started meeting to talk about ghosts, spirits, and all things supernatural. Ooh, I like it. I like it. The founding member of this group was Charles Dickens. No way! I swear to God, that's, yeah. that my mortal enemy, Charles yeah. Dickens, at it again. At this it fucking again, guy. Yeah. What was he? He he loved ghosts so much. I mean, he did write um the Christmas Christmas Carol, which is an early like a, a ghost story for pretty much from hmm. a little bit later than time we're talking about, but essentially the same period. Yeah, same sort of loved idea. Loved ghosts. Loved that. There was an, an another member as well who was another author. It was a uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the ah. creator of Sherlock Holmes. He this was guy. in as well. Yeah, so they were both early members of the club. 
Um, yeah, they would mainly investigate and debunk hauntings all across London. So this was like happening during like the peak of spiritualism within London where you couldn't move for a seance club. Mm. Unfortunately, this group was still seen a bit goofy and a bit silly. Even, ah, unlike today. Yeah, unlike today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, they did manage to debunk and uh, like they... They had a couple of cases that they had. Really? Uh, yeah. W- one of the big ones uh, that they debunked was the act of the Davenport brothers, who were a team of American magicians touring England at the time. So what they used to do is they used to go into a box and they get tied up in, in, in the box with instruments and then the box would be sealed up and then the instruments would start playing. Ooh. And then the, the lid would be taken off the box and you could see them were still all tied up inside. And they're like, oh, who's playing it? It's like, well, he called on the spirits to play it. I mean, the the ghost club, they debunked the whole thing and essentially they ruined the Davenport brothers' livelihood. How are they doing it? Uh, oh, I don't know, actually. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> they were cheating. They were using magic. But uh, yeah, the ghost club, that's it's still ongoing to this day. So yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. And ghost stories, yeah, they were all the rage. They were common in the pubs across the country. You know, these are superstitious people who gobbled all that stuff. Gobble, gobble, gobble. These stories would pass into urban legend every so often being brought out after probably some kind of incident you know a murder or something like that that would have a link to an old tale which would catch the public consciousness and earn itself a new round of telling the next generation so our story begins in the dead hey look what i did there of winter 1803 the people of Hammersmith were then thrown somebody picked them up and fucked them into their very own ghost story which would have very real consequences and it began with several sightings and even bam bam knuckle your head assaults this story starts around christmas which again it's another time the georgian and victorian peoples they heavily associate with the with the supernatural christmas was always spooky christmas carol ghosts set at christmas everything's dark everything's cold everything's spooky already so you're gonna be it's a perfect time to tell ghost stories Mm -hmm. On the 15th of December, 1803, Thomas Groom, a drayman, which was a beer delivery guy, important man if you ask me, he was a a drayman to a local brewer, a Mr. Burgess, and Thomas Groom, he had a close encounter with the spirit while he and another worker were walking home just after 8pm. Like many sightings, pretty much all the sightings, they took place in the vicinity of the graveyard of St. Paul's Church. Now, this was the location of a number of, of previous sightings. Some people had seen things in that graveyard, spooky goings-ons. Um, now, some villagers, they believed the ghost belonged to a man who had slit his own throat there a year earlier. He had cut his own throat. And churchyards, they're not really the most, um, you know, relaxing places, I guess, to wander at night. Uh, and then let alone whispers of a possible demon being seen in, you know, the, the, the graveyard in the back of your mind. And the man, so they believed that this was, it was haunted by the, the ghost of a guy who killed himself. And, the, uh, you know, this guy was buried in, in the graveyard. And the common thought at the time was that he can't bury a suicide on unholy ground. So, Thomas, he was walking among the graves on his way home at around 8 p.m. that December evening. When all of a sudden, he described his experience as, as like an attack with the figure surprising him from behind a tombstone and grabbing him by the throat... His fellow worker, hearing a commotion behind, asked what was happening when, whatever it was, the thing, the being, spun him around. Thomas, he threw out a fist to try and get this creature off him. He felt something soft, so it's corporeal, I guess, if he felt something there. Like, he would describe it as, a, like, a great coat. Um, and then, this mysterious being somehow vanished into the tin air, leaving only the crisp winter nights behind him. So in the days after the assault by this apparition, uh, Thomas, he, he fell ill with a, with a terrible fever, and he suffered from that for, for a long time. But then he, he slowly recovered to recount his experience. So essentially, he got ghostly. And the, the Scots magazine at the time it printed a story of an elderly woman who also ran into the Hammersmith uh, ghost. And this old woman was literally driven insane by what she saw. What did she see? I don't know, I wasn't there, but I imagine it's pretty spooky. I love that. It's like, oh, it was so horrifying. It drove her insane. Yeah. That's why oh, I, cu- I couldn't possibly tell you. It was, it was too scary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, another tale of the Hammersmith ghost was of a horse-drawn coach, complete with 16 passengers who were left mystified when their driver fled the coach in fear. 
he'd apparently caught sight of the apparition and had been so frightened by it that he just completely abandoned uh, his passengers and the eight horses. Which, to be honest, sounds pretty funny. Like, I mean, the horses are probably faster than you, so I like how right. he... <laughs> There's also, like, it must be very confusing for the passengers. Uh, yeah. One of the accounts that I read was the coachman, like, he jumped off and just, like, fled into the nearest pub. <laughs> to, to sound the alarm uh, where like to the passengers this was just I just need a beer yeah just out of nowhere the, the coachman just jumps off and just runs into the nearest pub screaming which in fa- that's a great way to get off work and one I will be trying let's get to real story though an altogether uh, more shocking event uh, which had a much more darker ending well, was later reported when an unnamed pregnant woman she witnessed a tall white figure rise from among the tombstones in the churchyard and that sight caused her to faint seeing this being uh she was found and taken home several hours later by neighbors they put her to bed and the woman died just a couple of hours later allegedly due to fright so this woman you're saying she died of fright but it was also she like she fainted and several hours later they found her and brought she died from exposure definitely (laughs) this was in december (laughs) it wasn't fright yeah 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 (laughs) She was in there for hours just trying to like... It's like freezing to death. Yeah, She's yeah, very, yeah. very blue by the time they find her. Well, here's a quote, right, about the story. This is from a, a newspaper at the time. One poor woman in particular, when crossing near the churchyard at about 10 o'clock at night, so I think there you go, beheld something, as she described, rise. Well, she only said the figure was very tall and very white. So, a tall white guy. <laughs> uh, she attempted to run, but the ghost soon overtook her and pressed her in his arms when she fainted in which situation she remained for some hours till discovered by some neighbors who kindly led her home when she took to her bed, from which, alas, she never rose. The locals of Hammerstone now at the time, they were genuinely terrified. You know, what had started in the pub with rumblings of strange sightings and half-overheard whispered tales of a ghostly figure turned into a full-blown hysteria. Story by story, the local legend built up in the neighborhood game of telephone. One person saw a faint specter rush across their view. Next, someone had been confronted and even assaulted by a giant demonic figure clad in animal skin, which sounds pretty fucking cool. That's even more terrifying, like from today's standards. You know, like even like I've heard some accounts where it was just they're in a long white shroud. It, it like essentially a tablecloth or, yeah. a, or a bed linen. <laughs> That's not that scary. But, like, for someone to kind of be, like, wearing the skin of a beast. Oh. That's scary. Hey. I'm scared today. Like, yeah, that's, no, that's terrifying. It's, it's pretty cool. And, and, and as you can say, like, the descriptions of the haunter, they varied from being clad in animal skins to being a tall person covered in a white shroud, like a cartoon ghost. And so people, they would hunker down in the church graveyard waiting. They were, he was going to get them some ghosts. They were going, they were waiting for the ghosts. They were, like, lock and load. But, you know, in this area, there were so many small lanes and paths in the area, they could never be sure where. Ghost and Strike next. On the 29th of December, 1803, William Girdler, a private night watchman, he saw the ghost on one of his nightly patrols on Black Lion Lane. He later described that during his rounds, he'd seen a tall, whitish figure, which, when he approached, lifted back a white sheet or tablecloth to reveal a dark cloak with metal buttons. He chased uh, the person, but lost them in the darkness. Now, it says he saw the ghost, or he said he saw the ghost. That's clearly not a ghost. That's clearly a person wearing a white shirt. (laughs) (laughs) Gotcha, it sounds like he mooned him. He's like, yeah, I gotcha. (laughs) Fuck you, buddy. And he's like sprinted off into the darkness. (laughs) Then, two days later, on the evening of December 31st, as 22-year-old Thomas Millwood was walking home, dressed, as always, in his bricklayer's garb, his his mother-in-law, she recalled how he was annoyed after running into two women and a man in the churchyard who accused him, they, they accused him of being the ghost. I love that. Just accusing, you the ghost! You the ghost, ain't ya? I don't talk. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You are the ghost. I, mean, I fucking know it. I am. <laughs> am I the ghost? Doubting myself? No. <laughs> what is life? The reason for this, really, was that Mill Millwood's job as a bricklayer required a very specific type of dress, which was all white, head to toe in white. So I think we can see how there was some... I kind of see how this is going to play out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can put two and two together. Yeah. He wore a white apron, white head covering. So, yeah, he kind of looks like a ghost walking around 
in the middle of the night. I mean, you're kind of asking for trouble, really, at this point. What was he wearing? His mother-in-law, Mrs. Fullerbrook, warned Thomas that he should uh, start wearing a, a large coat to cover his trade clothes and make him essentially not look like a ghost. Almost as if she knew it would be a very bad idea to walk around dressed in all white when people were panicking and terrified of local ghost sightings. He said, Nah, I'll be fine. Ah, don't worry about it. It'll be grand. Yeah, it'll be alright. So, yeah, but you think at this point, you know, maybe there was literally armed patrols walking around Hammersmith looking for any excuse to blow the shite out of this uh, ghost. I'd seen accounts as well from reading the court documents where his wife said that, uh, she said, I begged him to change his dress. So, I guess like like any real man, he'd just rather ignore his wife. Yeah. And be That's the man's way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to listen to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd rather die right, woman. than yeah, listen exactly. to you. <laughs> uh, so, I'm fairly certain his wife uh, probably had a good idea what was about to happen. Yeah. You know, and on this stage, ghosts or not, like a lot of people realized... Even if there was a ghost, there was also people out there dressing as a ghost and up to all sorts, you know. So, so that even just made the locals more angry and got more guns. They were just, 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 just stop it. That's what they were like now at this point. And one of those people was Francis Smith, a 29-year-old customs officer. Now, Smith was apparently infuriated by the prankster constantly scaring people and had decided he was going to put an end to this person's one. He said, listen here, boyo. I've had enough out of this. I've had enough out of you. Chick, chick, lock and load. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. So, late in the evening of the 3rd of January, 1804, Smith is having a few glug lugs in the Black Line pub, getting himself ready for a night of ghost busting. And he, he wasn't going to pull down his pants and give him a real sloppy one. <laughs> nope, he was not. It was a few scoops. And then off to kill some ghosts. But instead of carrying a trusty proton pack by his side, or whatever Charles Dickens and the other guy were carrying, he had a, a blunderbuss. Now, Keith, do you know what a blunderbuss is? <laughs> is it a sloppy one? <laughs> <laughs> Close, but no cigar, but it'll definitely give you a sloppy one. It was like a more advanced musket. It was deadly at short range. Essentially, it was like an old-timey shotgun. Like, it was a predece- it's a predecessor to modern... It's like those. Shotgun. It's like those ones from Bugs Bunny, you know, with the big long ends. Yeah, the big ends that looks like a trumpet. Taper out. Yeah, 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 exactly. That was essentially it. So you could blow the shite out of some ghosts with that. And so that same night, our old friend Thomas Millwood, who still refused to change his white garb, he stopped off after a long day at work to visit his sister Anne at their parents' home in where else but Black Lion Lane. And Thomas, as I said, hadn't changed his outfit. At around 10.30 p.m., Francis Smith came across William Girdler, who was out on his nightly patrol. Francis told Girdler of his intention. He's going to he's gonna hunt down, one, he's going to get me one of them ghosts. Essentially, that's what he was like. It's mad to hunt down. Girdler, he was dead. Fuck it, do it, bro. Got your back, bro. He was totally, he had his back and he was supportive. And he told him, you know, I'll help you out after he finished calling the hour, as they call it back then essentially during that he would patrol he, he was going to patrol some of the smaller lanes and then calling the hour was essentially act as a human clock he would go around oh, okay. shouting it yeah four o'clock i do that when i'm drunk sometimes and they, that sounds just awful by the way like if somebody did that around me i'd get the blunderbuss at, the, at that point like you'd be not having it you get a sloppy one it's also important like around this time this late at night in january not to underestimate just how dark the night was mm-hmm. Like, without modern street lighting and whale oil lanterns, like... It was pitch black. You couldn't see your hand in front. Cave dark. Absolutely. Cave dark, yes. They did have a password that they came up with. So Fra- So Francis Smith and his friends had this password where... So they wouldn't mistake each other for the ghost. So they would shout, Who comes there? And they would say, Friend! And then they'd get say, Advanced friend! So, it looks like they taught everything. Yeah. Um, like, I... Like, they had every single safety precaution they possibly could. I don't see how a bunch of scared men roaming around the dark with a bunch of guns could possibly go wrong with no. that sort of safety feature. I like how, was it only them who had the passcode? Because it could because it was only the two of them. Couldn't you say, hey, Thomas, is that you? Yeah. It, <laughs> shoot him! <laughs> <laughs> so later on, deep into the night, Thomas Millwood, he said goodbye to Anne and he left the house to go back to be with his wife. Unfortunately, that was at the exact same moment as Francis Smith was passing by. 
all Francis Smith saw on that cold night in that pitch black alleyway was a figure covered in white from head to toe approaching him. And like, at this point, his gut reaction was, this is a ghost. Like the idea of a brilliant prankster immediately went out the window. He legitimately thought the ghost was, was alive, it was real, and it was coming for him. He, he was so terrified, he could only manage to yell out a few words towards Millwood, shouting, Damn you! Who are you? What are you? Which he quickly followed with a squeeze of his gun's trigger and a shot echoed out throughout the otherwise silent streets. Do you know when, so I was reading through the court documents and uh, his sister was saying that when he left, so he was late, they were, he was in his mother's house and he was going to go meet his wife after and he was late to go meet his wife and his sister said to him, uh, I told my brother, your time is expired, you had better go. That's that's foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah oh, expired. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> just the way he spoke back then. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and his sister heard. What do you, you think that when she was like, "Oh, that that was a zinger." Yeah, she that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so when she heard the bang, and she she even saw the flash of Smith's blunderbuss, like that's how close she was. So she ran out into the street to check on her brother's welfare to make sure he hadn't been hurt. Surprise, surprise. He had been hurt. <laughs> Badly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, unfortunately for Anne, her worst fear was, was quickly realized when she found her brother lying dead in the street with no one else around and his white garb quickly turning red. See, see nobody else was around because, see, Francis Smith, he had ran straight to the pub where he found his old buddy, William Girdler. Smith and Girdler, accompanied by two other men, made their way back to where Millwood lay dead. On the way, Smith told Girdler that he was worried he'd hurt the man badly. Girdler, he himself, he'd even heard the gunshot, even though he's a little bit away. But back, this is back in the day, you know, gunshots, boop, 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 you know, it's like, yeah. gunshots be no big thing. The norm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Millwood, he had been shot in the lower jaw, and it's likely he was killed immediately. I mean, this type of gun is like an early shot. His face would have been pretty much gone. There was, uh, I think from the coroner was saying that, like, it was close range. His face was black with gunpowder. No, oh, So, man. like, this wasn't a shot from far away. This yeah. was a close range shot, which got him straight in the face. Exactly. And these guns weren't, like, firing. This was, like, after muskets. So it wasn't, like, the little round things they fired. They were, like, this is, like, a shot. Essentially, it fired it's a shit. cloud of smoke. Like. Yeah, exactly. So Girdler carried Millwood's body to the Black Line pub where the coroner and surgeon, they assessed the body determined the shot came from Smith's blunderbuss and had hit Millwood in the lower left side of his jaw, his spine, and even penetrated his spinal cord. The coroner said it was willful murder. And so Francis Smith, visibly shaken and remorseful, obviously extremely upset, surrendered himself to the authorities. Smith was held in jail until his trial began at the Old Bailey on the 13th of January, 1804. Ooh, just gets spookier and spookier. Ooh. Why? Friday the 13th? Was it actually Friday the 13th? You just said that. The 13th of January. Oh, I thought I, thought, I, thought I said Friday the 13th. Uh, Smith's defense at trial was that while he admitted he did kill Millwood, he ins- Wait, actually, maybe it was Friday the 13th. January, Friday the 13th, 1804, yeah. Oh, wow. Holy shit. That must be just in my subconscious somewhere. That's but really, I, I, that's I, I, really I, I must have read it somewhere. I'm like, yeah. I know my calendar. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, 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 1604, 2 June. That's a Tuesday. It was like the best, you'd be the best X-Men, I think, ever. <laughs> like, the uh, worst superpower. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get him, Keith. What day were you born? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Smith's defense at trial was that uh, while he admitted he did kill Millwood, uh, he insisted it was, you know, in the mistaken belief that Millwood was a ghost. And so he entered a plea of not guilty. And this is really the part of the story that would go on to haunt the legal system in England for 200 years. See, see, Francis Smith, he's, he seemed to be thoroughly remorseful and he even appeared, you know, quite traumatized by what had happened. He was pale, sickly, he was unwell, he couldn't really speak or stand unaided uh, at the trial. And Smith eventually managed to tell the court that while he had set out in the hope of catching that darn dirty prankster responsible, but, um, you know, once he'd seen Millwood, Millwood in his work clothes, he genuinely thought he was seeing a ghost and he was essentially just shitting himself so much he fired the gun because uh, he was worried the ghost was going to get him. 
freaked out. And so uh, the lead judge in the case, who was Lord Chief Baron MacDonald, he explained to the jury that nothing in this case could make the crime anything other than murder. And so the jury could only find Smith either guilty or not guilty of murder. No other outcome was acceptable. And prisons in those days, not great. Uh, the judge used the example of if a man had set out to catch a highwayman and not a ghost and had shot someone believing them to be a robber and that person turned out to be innocent, it would still be murder. Uh, you know, and the clear fact in the case was that in the moment and by his own admission, Smith had intended to kill whatever he was shooting. He was going to kill that goddamn ghost. And that was all that mattered. He also told the jury that no matter how angry Mr. Smith was that someone was causing panic with their pranks, he didn't, he still, even if he was out there to just kill the prankster. You, you can't just go around and kill a prankster. Even, you, know, you can't just roam the streets with a gun looking for them just because they're scaring shit. You can't just kill ghosts. And so the jury returned with a verdict an hour later, a verdict of guilty, but guilty of manslaughter, which was he hadn't even been charged with and didn't really apply to the case. Um, but it's easy to see why the manslaughter verdict was seen as preferable to the jury. After all, a gu guilty verdict in a murder, tr murder trial carried a mandatory Death by hanging sentence. The old, uh, was it short drop and quick stop? Straight down to the up place. However unsavory it might have been to them, the jury can only give a verdict within, within the charges given. Unsurprisingly, the judge was not happy at all with the attempt to cushion the verdict. He demanded the jury go back into the deliberation room and consider their verdict once more. This time he basically said, Guilty or not guilty, or else you're all going to jail. I mean, this is the early 1800s, so they didn't really kind of, didn't really kind of faff about it you know, back in those days. They went back and they, um, they, they, they found him. They found him guilty. They like they were they were sympathetic to him and his obvious remorse, but yeah, it was pretty much well. I we kind of are being forced to find him guilty. So uh, I guess guilty. I guess man, judges back in this day were not very impartial. They were like he like he literally was saying, yeah. find him guilty or you're screwed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He even said that the prerogative of showing mercy, which essentially means finding him not guilty, lay with the crown, meaning it was for the king essentially to decide. The man, the, if you think judges are gung ho nowadays, they were, bit, they're mad for the murder back then, mad for the killing. So he, that would mean that you know, um, he would be remanded in custody until he would be hanged the following Monday, followed by his body being sent to the medical school for forced dissection. Nice. <laughs> However, luckily for Smith, uh, the judge Macdonald, he knew there was a lot of public uh, chatter about the case, and there was even more growing sympathy for Smith. And so he ordered that the case be referred to the Crown, who in turn ordered respite during pleasure before 7 p.m. that same day. That essentially means that he got a stay of execution while the, while the Crown deliberated. Deliberated. They yeah. faffed about it. They, you know, kicked the tires in the case. And so on January 25th, King George III, he granted Smith a pardon as long as he served one year of hard labor. And so he was let go after that. That's, that's like a good question. That's like a, like a sales tactic. You know, because if initially you had been given like one year, like, no, but you give him death first and you go, actually, no, a year. It's like, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, exactly. It sounds <laughs> real good yeah. after the other option is getting your fucking neck broken and or hanging very painfully and slowly to death. And so that was, that was a case. That was how this initial case ended. But the story of the ghost, like, does that actually, like, was there actually a ghost in Hammersmith? Well, there was, there was someone who did come forward, um, John Graham, I think mm -hmm. his name is. Yep. Indeed. Um, so, like after the de so yeah, all the publicity surrounding the the case, John Graham, he's like a, a local shoemaker. So he stepped forward and claimed responsibility for being the ghost. He said that he wanted to scare the villagers as revenge because his apprentices at the time they told his children some ghost stories, um. But he only claimed to do it at once. Ah, but essentially he's a Scooby Doo villain, really. Yeah, he's yeah. Like, pull uh, as a shoemaker. Uh, <laughs> I only really did it to scare the kids <laughs> yeah, away from my theme park kind of yeah, bullshit. Like. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he he only admitted to the once doing it. So, yeah. uh, but we've we've gone through like many many accounts of this happening. So mm -hmm. there was definitely other accounts. There could have been other people Ooh. who, or it could have been other real ghosts. Spooky. Don't know. I know. I know. I like it. I like it. But yeah, that's it. Georgians, they loved, they actually loved their pranks. They loved playing jokes on each other, especially the spooky ones. Yeah. 
they are mad into it. For example, uh, just six years after the Hammersmith ghost murder, a woman named Margaret Salter, she staged a fake haunting in her shared lodgings to convince a fellow lodger, a Mary Anderson, to hand over a bunch of her possessions to satisfy an angry spirit that would torture and terrorize her if she refused. Um, and it was also a common thing for people to dress up in sheets throughout the period. Like, that's where the whole ghost sheet ghost comes from, is from this time period. Uh, and usually when they were doing, they would do it, they'd cover themselves in a sheet when they were committing crimes. And their excuse would be, it wasn't me, it was the ghost. Like, what an alibi. But it's not a ghost, it's you. Like, you can just lift the shroud and it's like, I, it's, I can clearly see you. <laughs> no. And so, the real legacy of the Smith murder trial, it had its legal consequences. The trial, it, it happened to expose a huge flaw in the system, with there being no available defense for someone who genuinely felt that action was uh, for a good purpose. And though possibly even violent, it was done in good faith, and the belief that they were doing the right thing. Um, that kind of nuance, it's very important in the legal system. And so having the opportunity to prevent a, def a defense, it's a, it's a vital part of most courts around the world. And it wasn't until the 1980s that the confusion caused by the Smith trial was finally put to bed with the case of Orr versus Gladstone Williams in 1984. Basically what happened was there was a man, uh, he seen a youth uh, seizing uh, the handbag uh, belonging to a woman who was shopping. And the man, he caught up with the youth and he knocked him to the ground. And then he twisted his arm behind his back in order to immobilize him. But while he was essentially beating up a kid a bus was going by at the time and so, some lad on the bus seen this so he jumped off the bus and ran up to the the older man who was attacking the kid and like kicked the shit out <laughs> <laughs> you know oh, no. but he didn't realize that the kid was the one like yeah so, yeah so that was the whole thing so the court like they ruled in like to some people like that for self-defense or the prevention of a crime the appealants must have honestly and reasonable grounds or believe the force was necessary to yeah stop it. that was like where like where they kind of finished this yeah yeah and that they yeah essentially they thought they were they were doing good well yes that is exactly right um the man he was charged he was convicted of assault causing bodily harm he appealed on the grounds that he genuinely thought the youth was being attacked that he was doing the right thing he was helping a kid uh when the kid was actually the villain here and his appeal it was successful and it set a precedent in uk law with uh, some Lord guy, uh, Lord Lane CJ, more like Lord Lane BJ, on giving his decision, uh, <laughs> nice. he remarked that, nah, did you say nice? Nice. Thanks, dude. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> uh, that was just off the dome as well. He remarked that if the defendant may have been laboring under a mistake as to the facts, he must be judged according to his mistaken view of the facts. So that's just a lot of words. But basically saying, yeah, you should take the person, what they believed was actually going on, into mm. account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and had that defense been available to Francis Smith 180 years earlier, he could have been saved from a lot of stress and a year's hard labor. But, I mean, he still got off pretty lightly with a year's Considering he shot a man point blank in the face. Blew his head off. Yeah. Yeah. Although, I mean, come on, this Thomas Millwood, he probably should have, like, not worn white after he was already accosted and accused of being the ghost i don't want a victim blame but again you know the hammersmith ghost is it real is it fake i don't know there were some other accounts as well after no. that of the hammersmith ghost really do yeah do tell so there was in 1824 there was new reports of a hammersmith ghost this was arose. 20 years after the events 20 years later yeah so but <laughs> at this time so they had obviously like improved on the story of the ghost and it was granted superpower of fire breeding Ooh, this time Ooh, nice that's dude. a good ghost that's a good ghost <laughs> that's really good but the, uh, yeah there were direct reports of this new ghost attacking people uh, in one instance the ghost jumped on a woman and brutally tore her clothes off her body and scratched her face with what seemed to be small hooks the ghost seems to be turning a little rapey now. Uh, yeah, there was a number of attacks on women from this new ghost in 1824. Uh, the London, <laughs> this is funny, the London packet of New Lloyd's Evening Post, uh, a newspaper, they actually suggested that a few stout young men go out into the night dressed in female apparel in order to catch the ghost, which I think is pretty funny. That new ghost, he was apprehended on uh, February 19th, 1825, and he was put before the magistrate. And, uh, yeah, he was revealed to be just a guy called John Benjamin. Uh, his defense was it was a joke. 
Nah, so, okay. When I was just trying to rape those women, it was a joke. Yeah, uh. Not a very funny joke. No, it, no. It, it wasn't a good one. I didn't no. laugh. But uh, yeah, and then like after that, um, the Hammersmith ghost, like the sightings kind of calmed down a little bit. Um, there was a new ghost that kind of took the headlines of newspapers. It was called Spring Hill Jack. Ooh, the legendary mm. Spring Hill Jack. Yeah, so that took its place in public consciousness in the late 1830s. So kind of after that, the that ghost, uh, the Hammersmith ghost died down. But there was still uh, locals um, saying that the ghost returns to Hammersmith Churchyard every 50 years. Um, when was the last time he returned? Well, so, I suppose then. There was once in 1955. So this actually got a bit of... Um, attention from the public. So on Friday, uh, July 29th, 1955, the West London Observer published a headline saying the ghost that haunts Hammersmith may appear on Wednesday. Oh. Weather depending, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's rainy. It's not yeah, wet, if I've got shit to do, I'm not going. Exactly. You know? It's a whole, yeah. you know, it's wet. But uh, yeah, the news, new, newspapers, national newspapers, they picked up this story and the day that the ghost was due to make its appearance on the Wednesday, the 3rd of August, there was over 100 amateur ghost ho- hunters Ooh. and journalists and those curious people. They showed up to St. Paul's Church. Uh, yeah, and they waited till 12 to catch a glimpse of the ghost, uh, which is didn't come. Uh, so after like the ghost didn't show up at 12 o'clock, which is meant to, people kind of left. But there was a handful of journalists and a couple of uh, ghost hunters. It was that really dis- late. They decided to stay because they decided to stay because they figured out that uh, daylight savings ah. didn't uh, didn't it wasn't adopted by the UK until 1916. So ah. they realized that um, it He's was actually the old clock. Yeah, so at 12 o'clock was actually 11 o'clock. So they waited another hour, and yeah, they said when the clock struck one, spectators heard an unusual rushing sound like a sudden wind. Uh, the newspaper account reported that something in white wafted out of <laughs> wafted out the northwest doors of the church which were locked and drifted over to a lone tomb and a ghostly figure in brilliant white which had no legs according to witnesses it floated above the tomb for about 20 seconds and then it just disappeared so the the next time the ghost is meant to, was meant to appear was 2005 then and an article was put out but it didn't receive a lot of attention in 2005 so wait are you sure it wasn't just a piece of tissue paper that got lifted up by a strong breeze could have been. I mean, like, been. Like, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> That's like, what it sounds like. It was a plastic bag. I mean, like, you can believe that or you can believe the account of a couple, a couple of amateur ghost hunters that mm. really want to believe well, in seeing ghosts and not waste their time. So. No, of course not. <laughs> you know, they don't want to look stupid over here. Of Come course, on. yeah, yeah. Did they hear a knock in reverse? Oh, That's the question. Ooh. No. <laughs> the next time then the ghost will appear is 2055. So in 32 no. years, 2055. maybe we can... All right, I've set my watch. Keith, what day of the week will that be? Uh, my powers. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you uh, checking out the old podcast. Uh, that will do for this old one. Thank you so much to Keith for joining me as we told the tale, spooky, of the Hammersmith ghosts. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, man. Always a pleasure. Never a chore. Very appreciate good. It. Thank you. I appreciate those very, very kind words. And um, yeah, so here at Listens, always please check out the podcast every Monday and Friday and videos every Tuesday and please write and review and all that kind of stuff it really helps out the channel so so much but until the next one as always please take care of each other and yourselves because I love you yeah you do I love you too <laughs> Mike out <laughs> <laughs>